Hey everyone and welcome back to our Rust and Orboot hacking streams here. Today we are going to look at something new once again. And as you can already see with the website I have opened here, this is about the Vision 5.2, which is the second development board from the company called Star5. And lo and behold, I actually have the board right here. Well, this here is the package, um, well, mirrored for you. Uh, but nevertheless, I also have the board here. Uh, I already attached something to it, which is a USB serial converter. And that's also how I'm powering the board here, uh, making it rather convenient. And this here has now dip switches, unlike the Vision 5.1 that we looked at before, where you know you had a, a like a button that you could press to enter a bootloader mode. And for this year, I had to uh, set the uh, switches both to the other side in order to be able to load my firmware image over a uh, UART. So that's what we're using the USB serial converter for. Now, I uh, have this article here open though, uh, which is about development for the Vision 5.2 with a deprogramming language. And I mainly want to feature this here because it's actually been very, very helpful uh, for some first steps, especially with getting to understand the GPIOs. Uh, because on, on this board here, uh, well, or the SOC on that board, uh, that's a bit uh, different again than before. And to be specific, the SOC here is the JH7110. So prior to that, on the Vision 5.1, we had the JH7100 which is like the predecessor. Uh, the cores are still coming from the company Sci-5. So yeah, actually, uh, I actually put the Sci-5 logo here on the box. Uh, that's it. Well, uh, mirrored again for you, I'm very sorry. Um, nevertheless, so yeah, uh, I'm sort of glad I got the board now. So if you recall earlier, I was saying, well, there is not much documentation out there yet and so on. Um, but yeah, it turns out that they actually did start to push out some documentation. And that is what I want to look at in a bit. Um, but yeah, first let's uh, scroll a bit through this article here. So uh, yeah, this is uh, also documenting the setup a bit similar to what I have. There is a USB serial converter here. Um, they're using a dedicated USB uh, uh, a USB cable here just for powering the device. Well, it's not strictly necessary. So, you know, I'm just using the power supply from the USB serial converter. Um, they are attaching an LED somewhere. I uh, actually also have an LED here, but yeah, we will mainly be looking at serial output. So yeah, I don't really want to bother too much showing that here right now. Um, and well, here they are uh, saying how you can install custom firmware. Well, um, specifically this year is for uh, making, I think, an SD card image. And well, they, they're using a tool here called VF2 Imager. I think they actually made it themselves or something. Um, we're going to do something a bit different and I will show you that in a bit. Uh, just for the sake of completeness here, we have the uh, header. So that's the GPIO pin header. And this is where I attach the UART. So if you look at this here, there is a ground pin here. And then we have the URT, X and RX pins. Those are the ones I connected. And I'm supplying the power directly here uh, to one of those two pins here. So yeah, they are, uh, you know, just uh, also possible to use for powering the board. So yeah, uh, they are doing something very similar here in this tutorial. Um, I'm not sure why uh, they are also yeah, they're not really following conventions here. So they have this uh, one non-attached uh, uh, black cable here. So that's what I'm using for powering. So I would connect it to the five volts here. Um, but yeah, so conventionally you would just use the black wire for uh, ground. Uh, I mean, th they just had some uh, wires here that you know were uh, already strapped together. So yeah, they didn't really bother. Uh, yeah, like you know unwrapping those or something. Anyway, um, yeah, so let's uh, scroll down a bit further again here. Um, they're documenting a bit how the cores are connected together. So there are four application cores. Those are U7 cores. So you remember, uh, we also had this confusion, like what is actually the core? What is the core complex? What is this MC thing and so on? So it turns out the actual cores are called U7. 
that is very clear here now. And there is another core, an S7 core, which is a bit of a different core uh, for monitoring. Um, anyway, we don't want to get too much in detail here either. Uh, I just want to briefly point this out here. Uh, so if you want to read up on that, uh, have a look here. Uh, and then it goes on with blinking an LED and how the GPIO pins work. Well, uh, they're, they're using some uh, simple timer here uh, using the uh, RISC-V M time uh, register. So yeah, I guess they are even uh, using something something else here for the timer. Anyway, um, yeah, the GPIO driver, they're documenting it here. It's, it's a bit strange. So um, there is like... Uh, th there is a few register blocks, one for, uh, you know, different functionalities that you have for the GPIO pins. Those are, for some reason, called D-O-E-N. So that is for, like, data or uh, whatever output enable. But it's actually not just enabling for turning off and on. It also multiplexes over many different modes. So if you uh, if you want, you can actually use each and any of those pins for any purpose uh, that we will look at in a bit uh, in the documentation. And that is why you have this uh, very long mask here. So you see this here. Now, the mask actually has to be inverted. That might also be a bit counterintuitive. Uh, they're documenting that here as enable is active low. So they are using this here, the tilde operator uh, in Rust, that would be like uh, the exclamation mark um, for, you know, getting uh, the inverse. So like the bitwise negation uh, of a value. So yeah, the, the actual mask then here uh, would actually be like in, instead of uh, 3F. So those are actually all, all the ones that you have here in the binary representation are the bits that you can set to different values. So you have six bits here, right? So these here are four bits. So F is like one, 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 three is one, one. So this here is like, if you take this as an eight bit mask, that would be zero, zero, one, 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 one. Okay. Um, so in a similar fashion, uh, there is also something here for output. So if you just you know set up a GPIO like for an LED or something um, that you would like to uh, just turn off and on, you would just use the values one or zero, right? So for on and off. Um, but yeah, they also have some like other uh, functions there. Uh, I'm not so sure yet, so I, I still haven't understood this completely. Um, but to us, luckily, it doesn't really matter because we are very fortunate in the default configuration for getting the UART to work on those uh, pins, which are, uh, you know, in the uh, image that we just looked at above, you know, the default setting is really that those are the UART zero pins. So you can just use them right away. You only need to turn them on. So in this um, enable register for it, uh, you would just need to set both pins to one. So yeah, n none of the other possible values. So we have two to the six, so 64 different values. Uh, theoretically, only 49 of those are actually valid, but yeah, whatever. We can uh, look at that briefly in the documentation a bit. Anyway, so yeah, I hope that wasn't too confusing. Uh, it took me a while to understand it. So yeah, I'm also, I'm actually expressing that a bit different than Rust, and I'm just, I'm just writing the mask directly. Uh, so, well, not the mask, but the value directly in, instead of uh, applying uh, all of this logic here, because it's like, for our purpose, it's unnecessarily uh, complicated. Anyway, yeah, so they're just toggling uh, on and off an LED here. Uh, well, or doing a blinky, right? So you turn it on, wait a second, turn it off, wait a second, and so on. Um, that is very trivial. So yeah, they have a nice picture here of it uh, actually lighting up. And then they are writing a UART driver. And so if you recall from the Vision 5.1, uh, we also wrote a bit of a UART driver, so we're using the uh, Rust embedded HAL traits for doing so. And I could actually reuse most of the code that we had before. Um, there is only one thing I couldn't do, and that was the setup of the clocks. So, uh, well, actually the baud rate, so the baud rate depends on the clocks. They're not doing that here either. So, yeah, um, we, we will also not 
go too much into detail regarding that because you know you would need to understand the clocks first in order to be able to derive the right value so yeah we, we just don't care for now and that's okay yeah they they are doing some printing here and then telling you about like reinstalling the default firmware which you can actually download from star 5 and yeah we will look at that in a bit so they also make regular releases now so that you can upgrade um yeah they usually have release notes in the forum so recently they are uh, you know they pushed out a new image it's not like fully compatible with every operating system version they're pushing so there are some caveats there if you you know want to use that here uh just go and check out their forums for details yeah um anyway th this person here uh actually if you read through the article you will also see they were a bit frustrated with missing documentation um it's it's still not uh, in a very very good shape but yeah you can see that you're down in that sentence. Unfortunately, the devices on the Vision 5.2 are not documented very well. So making controllers for more advanced devices seems impractical, um, which is okay for us because we only want to do initialization firmware. We don't really need to care about, I don't know, like the GPU, for example. There is actually a, an embedded GPU on this thing here now uh, coming from uh, Imagination or Imagine Tech whatever i think it's imagination um anyway so yeah they're the supplier for the gpu uh but yeah whatever there is a driver available in linux with some some close source blobs from uh what i know at the moment um but yeah we're we're not uh nearly uh going there uh in, in the next few streams here yeah it's just you know as a remark so yeah what have i done so far um i can actually show that so I already started uh, a draft pull request here and well so far i just copied over uh what i had done so far for the vision 5.1 which is oh you see tons of commits here um <laughs> and well then i added some for the vision 5.2 there is a uh well there is a repository uh which has a tool which we will also look at in a bit that is referenced here um that tool is now necessary to wrap our uh, firmware image uh, in you know some specific header so with the previous one we only had to have like the um the the size of it uh, at the front so that was just a 32-bit value um i actually didn't didn't even bother writing something sensible i just wrote some large enough numbers so it would always be fine for us um yeah here in, in this case now you actually need to have some a specific header with a checksum and stuff like that anyway yeah um let's quickly skim through the currently available documentation so there is a memory map available now so these are all the base addresses for different peripherals like the uart for example that is sitting here at hex one triple zero quad zero uh yeah it's a 64k block but I mean, we just need a few register from it anyway. Um, yeah, th there is like tons of uh, devices on this here now. The DDR5, that is now sitting at this address. Uh, we might actually want to copy that now. And uh, we will put that in our code later on. Then we have like a bunch of other stuff. Right, DDRC, the DDR controller that is sitting here another value that we may want to copy and well beyond all of this stuff here uh there is even more and that is here pci express so on this board now we also find a pci express bus so at the bottom uh there is an m2 connector uh some people uh you know also use that for attaching a gpu for whatever fun reasons um i'm personally not doing that and i'm not even interested in that right now because again we're doing initialization firmware here uh we, we don't need to care about that at all anyway so as you can see it's it's a very very long memory map um so yeah we will uh, get back to that in a bit and at some point copy over this value all right so regarding the gpo uh, signal so they, they're calling it output signals it's actually like the different functions that you can use and they are documenting it in such a table here. So in, in this column, 
we have what they call output enable, which is actually the output function, right? So in, in, in this instance here, this is the simple case where it's either zero or one, um, but it can be any of those different functionalities here, like, I don't know, some some SDA, for example, that is like some serial data. Uh, this is now for HMI. Then you would need to set it to the value two. Uh, so yeah, th this here should actually read like off and this here would be like default value. Um, yeah, and then there is a bunch of other stuff like, I don't know, some PWM for, I don't know, some eight channel, whatever PTC is, SPI is something and whatnot. And it goes all the way down here to, well, actually we just skipped it, 49. So this is why six bits are sufficient for setting all the values. Six bits allow for 64 values, right? And 49 here is the maximum value starting at zero. So we actually have 50 different values possible. Um, yeah, anyway, so we we don't really need to mess with that too much. Uh, we just need to have a first understanding of it. Well, and then there is all of this stuff here. And yeah, I don't want to uh, go into detail here either because uh, again, it's uh, I, I still don't understand this here fully um, and we don't really have to. Now, there is something else which may become interesting at some point. These are the uh, so-called system control registers. Um, they're related to the clocks, for example. So there is like a clock multiplexer selection here. Um, I'm not yet too sure how we would want to use that or if we need that at all. Um, the CPU core clock can also be selected here. Uh, like you can uh, choose between different dividers. Um, they are saying, well, default minimum and typical value would be just one and the maximum is seven. So yeah, I don't know. Here it says it's, you know, 24 bits. So I don't even know why it goes up to seven. So for seven, you just need three bits, right? Anyway, um, yeah, there, there, there is a few other things here. I don't want to go too much into detail here again, because if you look at the scroll bar here, it actually goes like a very long way down. So yeah, let's look at the next thing. So there is this repository. If you remember, um, we actually looked at that. So this is a recovery bootloader. And we use that for uh, doing a small modification at some point. And we put our own string bootloader into it instead of bootloader, just because it's hilarious and, you know, to see if we can compile and run this thing. Um, anyway, so yeah, this here is unfortunately not for the Vision 5.2. So there is a recovery bootloader, but it's not in here. And it's not yet uh, like there are no sources available so far. So yeah, let's look at the next thing. So this here is the latest uh, firmware release or well, not just firmware, it's like all the software. Uh, they're also listing a bunch of details here. Anyway, so you can see a few things. There is this year called uboot something dot out. This year is an actual firmware image. Then there is fwpayload.img. Um, that is like the uh, larger image. I'm, I'm not exactly sure actually how everything here is tied together. Um, this year is like, if you look at this, 2.67 megabytes, and this year is 128K. So this year is just the SPL or second program loader, as they call it uh, here in, in U-boot terms. So they're counting the mask room, what is actually baked into the chip as the first and then a second comes U-boot. So yeah, it could be that this here is included in that, or I don't know, they, they probably have some helper scripts for updating and everything. There is an SD card image here, which is 800 megabytes. So that already contains like, I guess, a full operating system and everything. So you can just copy that to your SD card. And then depending on how you set the switches, you can boot from the SD card directly. Anyway, uh, yeah, we don't do that either. Um, actually, we don't really need to care uh, too much more about this. I just wanted to show you this briefly if you want to play with that. So let's look at the next thing. So as I told you, um, there is also a loader here now that we can use over uh, UART. And Heinrich Schuchat from Canonical uh, has actually worked on that again. So there were some changes. Uh, you know this repository here, JH71XX Tools. 
we were also using this utility to send our firmware to the Vision 5.1. Now there is a special branch here for the Vision 5.2. So yeah, this here is still uh, written in C. There are now some changes for uh, covering the Vision 5.2. Um, but I actually wanted to see if we can also do this here ourselves and write this in Rust. So what I did was I looked at what the protocol beyond the, uh, behind this here is, and it's something that is called Xmodem. And specifically, this here is the CRC version of Xmodem. So Xmodem is like a very, very simple transfer protocol. It's actually about my age, so it comes from the 80s. And somebody just, you know, hacked that up at some point because, you know, they needed it. And, well, it popped up in various places again and again, uh, like here on the mass grums now. So, yeah, but this here is not like... It's, it's not a proper uh, implementation of the protocol. There are there some issues with that. So yeah, they also have some comments here regarding that. And that's actually why we have this extra tool. Otherwise, you could just use some other way to go X modern tool. Anyway, so if you want to look at the um, protocol description, I uh, you know just <laughs> open the PDF file here. Uh, this here is the protocol reference. And as you can maybe see from the type setting, it's a bit older. This year was formatted in October 1988. So that was already, uh, you know, a, f a few years after it was created. I think it was uh, like published in 1986. Um, yeah, and then Chuck Forsberg uh, took this year and, uh, you know, made some uh, editing, like formatting and so on. Yeah, um, licenses were a bit different back then. Uh, they're saying maybe redistributed without restriction, uh, whatever. And the company back then was Omen Technology Inc. I've actually never heard of them. I'm not even sure if they still exist, but apparently they are from Portland, Oregon. So yeah, somewhere uh, you know overseas. And there is uh, <laughs> this is even funny. This is now retro computing. Uh, back then they were using these BBS systems. So BBS is like uh, bulletin board system, I think. And uh, you would need to dial up with a modem or something in order to use that. So they're also telling you the speed for using and so on. Um, and, and some, I don't know, sequence here. I have no idea how this works. I never did that. So yeah, that was before my time. It's just funny to find this in here. Um, yeah, actually, a, a friend of mine, when I told them uh, I was working on uh, X modem stuff, they were asking if I was doing retro computing. I was saying, no, I'm actually doing like modern RISC-V high performance computing stuff now. Anyway, yeah, that's a bit hilarious. So coming to X modem and Rust, there is a very, very luckily a crate called xmodem.rs. Unfortunately, that hasn't been maintained in a few years. So the original aut author was... Um, a Welke? Was it like Adam or something? Actually, I actually forgot. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Welke. Alan. It was Alan Welke. Um, from or based in Paris right now. I would guess it's an English name. Anyway, um, yeah, so NYC Resistor, that is the uh, hackerspace in New York City, they forked it at some point and made some improvements. And well, then again, I took it and made some more improvements. I actually have even uh, more pending uh, in like a local copy. Um, yeah, anyway. So yeah, back, back then, uh, when, when this year was uh, started, uh, there was no real um, possibility to provide feedback uh, during the transfer. So if you were transmitting a large file, you know, you would just get like no output. So somebody suggested doing this year and providing a packet callback. So yeah, I uh, picked this here up and I actually did this. So I took the patch from here uh, and made a bunch of adjustments so that we can also uh, print out our progress. And with that, let's now eventually get into our own code. So here I have the, um, well, a, a local tree copy of Orboot and I'm in the Vision 5.2 branch. Uh, there is like uh, a draft pull request as we uh, saw like very early in the beginning of the stream here. And what I have so far is something that can do a blink and also print to a serial port. And well, that is still a bit hacked up at this moment. It's not even using macros right now. 
uh, but that is something I want to do next. So I want to, before I run this here, I want to briefly look at a makefile that I just wrote. Uh, this makefile is not doing very much. So there is a run task and the run task, well, um, it's, it's doing something that is not even necessary anymore. So let's actually quickly change that already. Uh, I did a copy of the firmware image, uh, but you know, that is not really necessary. So we're doing two things here. We're applying this command here, vf2 header and vf2 loader. So vf2 loader, that is the thing that I wrote in Rust, which is using the xmodem crate. Uh, and then, you know, loads the file, transfers it over and prints the progress. Currently, our file is very, very small, so we don't actually see much progress, but yeah, whatever. Um, and I'm pointing at this here. So this tool here, VF2 header, it's actually just, uh, you know, a local alias of mine. So the original tool is called SPL tool. Well, it's not being too specific. Um, so it actually does create a header and let's have a brief look at that. So let's open the website of this here. Um, this SPL tool thing, it's in this directory SPL tool. Uh, you would just run it and then you would get from some file, you would get something that is the same file name with .normal.out behind it. And that is then what you can eventually send over to the board or even put it like on an SD card or write it to the uh, spy flash that is now at the bottom of the board. Um, by the way, this time it's not a W sun, but it's uh, actually a, um, I actually forgot the name of that. Uh, like it's, it's one of the uh, nicer ones that you can directly attach a clip to. Um, yeah, I, I, I forgot what the name of the form factor is. Anyway, it's it's a bit nicer to deal with if you want to program it with like an external programmer. So that would be a nicer option if, you know, you can reuse uh, like the very slow recovery bootloader, for example, that we have, which allows for, again, using Xmodem to transfer something. And if you really want to write the entire 16 megabytes, that would take, I don't know, 15 minutes or something. I don't know, some, some terrible long amount of time, maybe maybe five minutes or 10 or something. I don't really care, but um, yeah, it's, it's just very, very slow. So yeah, this is the tool. Um, and uh, that's actually something I think we looked at earlier here also. Uh, if we look at the issues filed, so there is a closed issue, and this is the one that I open at some point uh, this year. So. Yeah, I, um, because back then it wasn't actually open source, so I reverse engineered the uh, format of the header to write. So the header is uh, hex 400 bytes long, so that is like one kilobyte. And well, I documented all the structure and everything. And then somebody named Electrosys here took that and said, hey, look, I have written that in C now. So they made another implementation of this year written in the C programming language. And that is now merged into the code base here. So yeah, if we uh, if we want to use this tool now, we can actually build it from source ourselves. Well, and there is, of course, the possibility that we just rewrite that in Rust because it's actually very, very simple. You <laughs> just need to, you know, write a very small header, like, you know, with, with a very, very few entries. So it's really just a checksum, if I understood correctly, some fixed values. And um, well, you can uh, write some arbitrary version number into it. I'm not even sure how that's interpreted. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm also writing that down here that I'm already using this now. Uh, so I'm very, very happy for uh, this thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, if, if you're new here, uh, just get used to it. I uh, you know sometimes refer to things here and then I put everything uh, in the show notes when the video is uploaded to YouTube again. Okay, so now that is the make file. Um, now let's actually run this here. So when I now say make run, um, let me get rid of the other stuff here. Uh, that will then build our code, transfer it, and well, it would automatically run already when the transfer is finished. So I don't need to do anything extra. Um, now there is only one caveat with this here now. So there is a reset button on the board, but I always need to disconnect it and reconnect it again, because otherwise it doesn't actually get back into the bootloader mode for whatever reason. 
I guess that is just not implemented. Anyway, so we're now saying make run. Um, it's printing out a bunch of errors and now it already says done. So it says done because the transfer is like hilariously fast. Um, it's also printing like the intermediate files here. Uh, and well, uh, for me, it's currently still uh, blinking um, because that just sometimes happens. The transfer protocol is also a bit flaky. So what I'm going to do is we'll unplug this again and plug it in again and say make run again. Okay, uh, now you actually see these here, uh, those two arrows. Those are the uh, progress errors that I'm printing in the Rust tool. And well, it's uh, it's it's still blinking for some reason. Anyway, uh, let's now run this uh, with Minicom after it. So what I'm going to do is again, unplug. This is getting a bit annoying now, but well, I get used to it. Uh, then let's just rerun it and run Minicom. And now we, well, we see CRC error, try again. Oh, well. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know why, to be honest. Um, so we, we can also do this here. We can also say run X and then it would actually use the uh, JH7110 recover tool. Um, yeah. And we can actually rewrite the tasks here a bit. So yeah, I, I'm i making a, a header task now, which is just adding the header. Uh, and I'm declaring this here as a dependency. It just makes things a bit easier. So I did, don't need to do that here. So yeah, I made a second make task here. So it's called run X. So run X is just using uh, Heinrich's um, loader instead of mine. Uh, yeah, we, we, we can see if that works now. So we can say make run X instead of make run. Um, yeah, uh, CRC or try again. Well, thank you, I guess. It, it just happened. So even with like Heinrich's implementation or my implementation, it doesn't really matter. It just happens all the time. Oh, great. Now we have it. Okay. So what do we see here? Um, well, Heinrich's tool is not really made for this here. So it's uh, not for just one off running, but it's actually meant for, you know, turning into the recovery mode. And then um, from the recovery uh, binary that is being provided, so that is like a closed source firmware image they have, it provides the um, X modern transfer again for, you know, some other image. So yeah, this is why this is hanging now. So I'm interrupting this. Um, yeah, so with the tool that I made, you know, it really just runs it directly. And uh, yeah, let's try that again. And here we go. So what we see is we see our boot, we see a crab emoji, and then we see the boot mode printed. So let's have a very, very brief look at how this here works. So uh, this here is now our main function. So what we're doing here is we're setting up a few GPIO pins. So this here is just for, um, I think this is actually for just uh, blinking the LED. So yeah, this is GPIO 4243. So if you um, if you want to, uh, you know, um, set values in, in those, uh, like for one of the GPIO pins, you need to set like, one of the, uh, like you have 32 bit registers and eight of these uh, bits for uh, each GPIO pin. So this here is a 32 bit registers, uh, a 32 bit register, and there is then eight bits for GPIO pin 40, another eight for 41, another eight for 42, and another eight for 43. So yeah, that's how it works. And that's both for the enable register and also the data register. Um, we may actually want to rename this from EN to mode or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure yet. Yeah, I just put everything here currently in like a different file. So it's called init, but yeah, it doesn't really matter right now. Um, it's just a defined constant. So if you want to look at this, uh, it's, it's really just hex 28 off from the uh, base register for this year. They're calling it IOMAX. I just kept the name for now, and that is really just this value here, 
hex 1304.0. So yeah, let's actually do this now and add the uh, values that we had for the DRAM register. So if we uh, look at this here again, so the DDR controller is this value. So we can say pub const, pub const, this is DDR controller base, uh, CTRL base, that is a use size. And yeah, we, we don't need to have the extraneous uh, zero, zero at the beginning. So we have the controller base, and then we have the DDR phi, and the phi was at a different address that was up here, there. It's just 13 and then lots of zeros. Whoops. And there we go. So as you can see, um, this is actually very, very close to the IO max base register. So if we look at this here again, IO max uh, that is here, then there is something called syscon, the system control register, uh, or our base register for it. And then there is CRG. It could be like some other configuration or clocks and so on. Um, yeah, it's actually this thing here that we also looked at uh, very briefly. Where, you know, I, I don't know what CRG is short for. They're saying sys, CRM, system control registers. Yeah, I don't know, the abbreviations are a bit weird sometimes. Anyway, so we got those now. And uh, what we will need to do is, for now doing the DRAM initialization, which would already be our next step, we can look at the U-boot refer uh, reference code again. So um, for the Vision 5.1, we took the code from a dedicated repository. So they made one for just you know initializing the DRAM. There was some extra code in there as well, uh, but it was mainly for doing the DRAM initialization. Then we copied everything over, you know, and then I just rewrote the C code and Rust. So you know, just by doing search and replace, it's very simple. Um, yeah, so that would also be the next step here. Well, and we want to set up a print macro. So the print macro would be so that we, you know, we go back again here. Currently, I'm writing uh, print, and then I'm passing on something for printing on, and then the string that I want to print, and there is currently like no formatting support uh, whatsoever. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, you know, we're just uh, working around this currently. Um, now, another thing that we can briefly look at is the setup of the serial port. So the serial port is, again, uh, sort of the same as before. So yeah, it's, uh, it's compatible with this. Um, I actually forgot the name again. It's, it's, it's some, some number sequence. Um, anyway, it's like 8250 and Twice that is like 16,500 something, 16,200, what, whatever, uh, some, some odd number. And uh, yeah, that is like a very, very common uh, piece that is found in many devices. But then again, there is like tons of variants and so on. So yeah, what you typically would need to do is you would need to set up like, uh, you know, the length of a word, um, the parody that you want to use and stuff like that. And also the divisor and the divisor again is related to the clocks and we don't really know the clocks yet. So I just left a note here and left out setting it up because currently, you know, the default setup that we already have from the mask room, which is also what initialized the X mode on transfer, it's just fine for a start, right? So we don't really need to bother here. And maybe that's just the default value anyway and the mask room isn't even doing anything else. So yeah. Um, that is really just all you need to do for uh, setting this up. And then, you know, uh, well, I have this debug function here that is also uh, not actually necessary. It's not even used, so we may as well just remove it here. Um, yeah, and then here we have our print functions, which are just using the embedded hell crate. Now, they also made some changes in that. If you look closely here, this is now embedded hell NB for non-blocking. So there is embedded hell and embedded hell non-blocking. Um, they're now split in two. So before that, uh, 
you know, and this is still like uh, some alpha version. Before that, they actually had this uh, like as like a subspace somewhere in embedded hell as well. So I think it was like embedded hell serial and then NB here and then write or something. Whatever. Anyway, yeah. So with that, uh, we have a bit of an introduction. There is a bunch of uh, unused values here, but yeah, whatever. These are for, you know, if you want to set up different modes, which yeah, we don't really need right now. Um, that's all we have so far. Uh, now there is, well, one thing uh, we just um, sort of skipped. I want to also just have a look at here. So we are printing something called a boot mode. And if you recall on this board, there are two switches through which you can um, configure the source to boot from. They call it boot mode in their documentation. So I've just adapted that name again. Um, and the boot mode can be either of those four here. You can boot from SPI, like from a spy flash, for example, that is the one at the bottom of the board. And that's also the default configuration. If like both switches are set to zero, then you can both uh, use both MMC sources. So there is MMC one and two. Um, I think this is where you have the SD card, for example. Uh, right, so you can have the SD card or at the bottom of the board, um, there is also some connector where you can uh, like, you, you can attach something else with um, an eMMC uh, part on it. So that would be like embedded MMC something. Um, yeah, I, I never really worked with that. So yeah, I can't tell you much about it. And what we're using is this mode here, UART and UART is for the value three, three meaning both switches on the other side. So yeah, and that is why we're seeing this year boot mode UART. So if we would um, write our image now to the spy flash, we would expect to see this year, we would see boot mode SPI. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I don't really want to try that out right now. Uh, not just because it's a bit of a hassle also and you know and, and you need to always like unplug and plug in again and you know then change the switches if something goes wrong i need to revert and yeah that's a bit annoying so i don't really do that right now I just load over uart and run things um yeah if, if you're curious on on this here uh this is just uh, the default setup for uh the uh, assembly part. So that is essentially the very same that we also had for the Vision 5.1. It's really just uh, copied over. There is no uh, no addition here or something um, in, in the same fashion as before. Uh, you know, we just suspend everything, which is not the boot UART, uh, the boot hard, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, by saying we only run on the uh, core number zero, which would be the monitor core, as we learned from uh, from from the blog post. So that would be the S7 core. Well, um, what we could now also do is we could read out like uh, the RISC-V registers, the architecture ID, implementation ID, and the vendor ID, right? So those here, and then we can print them. Um, the thing is, without the formatting, um, printing them would be a bit weird now. Uh, yeah, I guess we could, we could actually hack something up for uh, getting the print macros now. Um, let's see. So we have a write function and the print macro what we just need to use, well, we can actually hack it into here. So we have this here called S. Um, yeah. Okay. Let, let's do the following. Let's, uh, let, let's hack around a bit. So let's say um, that S is a uh, static. Uh, I actually forgot about the notation. Do we have something else static here? Oh, look, yeah. So it's a static mute serial thing. Um, and that is an option. 
uh, well, no, this here needs to be the name. So that would be like setting mute serial. And that is an option for a serial. Well, the specific serial here. And we initialize that to be none. And now here, we would say serial equals sum s. And now, instead of doing this here, we should be able to say that we use sum s in the print function. It's, it's a bit hacky. It's also a bit unsafe, but you know, uh, we don't really care here. Um, so what we say here is that s equals sum serial. Uh oh, this operation is unsafe. And that is why we're using the unsafe keyword here now. Problem solved. Okay, now we need to remove this stuff and this stuff and this here, this here, and this here, and here. Yeah, we don't need to pass this anymore. All right. Do we do we have everything? Uh, almost. There is something marked in red here. Oh. Oh, I know what happened here. Undo. All right. Um. No method named right for uh right. So. Hang on. Why is this now? No method found an option of. Um, hang on, I, I think we need to do like uh, if let if let sum s equals zero and then this here uh -huh. do I need to say like dot zero no there is no field dot zero how did this work again mm, no field zero on type yeah, whatever, get the new message. Cannot move out of serial.0 .zero as serial is a static item. Huh. If let sum. Hmm. Oh, right. I, I think it's actually uh, complaining about this here. So uh, we need this to be a static mute. Wait, isn't zero defined as a static mute? That is a static mute. Um, can we can we do this here? No. Can we can we do this here? Oh. Now oh, that works. Uh, can we do this here? Cannot borrow star s as mutable. Um. Can we do like s mute? Can we do this here? No. We can't. How did this work again? So let's look at the other serial thing. Oh.
So here we're saying, uh, this is by the way, also copied from the earlier implementation that we had. Um, this is our set logger function. Yeah. And here we're actually doing the s mute. And let's do this here. Um, oh, and, and this init here, uh, that is actually something, something slightly different. Anyway, um, Maybe, maybe we don't actually need to do all this dance here after all, and we can just use the existing code, which is doing this here. Uh, and we just need to use the uh, log crate here, which is currently unresolved, but never fear, for I is here. Um, log is actually coming from here. Oh, right, we, we don't need to, uh, we, we use this here instead of this here. And uh, lo and behold, now we say log set logger, uh, but it's actually not called set logger, it's called something else. What was it? Go to file, won't, won't go to file. Uh, Go to file. Um, yeah, this here. Uh, splendid. So what did we call it? We called it. Oh yeah, this here is mutex space. Um, we we were we were having some some trouble with this. Uh, with the mutex stuff. We may actually need to do it this way here, um, but let's see what happens. Where is the setting the logger? I think this is some work in progress stuff that I had here. Uh, so this is the right function. This is now the mutex. Oh, right, it's it's up here. Oh, and it's called init instead of instead of set. It's just init. So we say log init, and we give it s, but we need to give it. A reference. Uh, expected mutable reference and static. Uh oh. Um, is it like and mute something? Almost. Yeah, this is the horrible part about Rust. If you don't understand this stuff, then it's it's really hard to do. So let's do this here. Um, let's init init logger. That we call it init logger. Init logger, and we pass down our s. Okay, expected and mute something serial. But it found uh -huh, a struct. Consider mutably borrowing it here. So we just say and mute s. Okay, that looks better. But here it's still a bit unhappy. Oh, found a reference again. Oh, wait. Oh. Oh. That was already it. Nice. 
So now we could technically use the print macro and I will just comment out this here for now. Uh, let's, let's see if we can print our crab emoji. And we will not need this here. Uh oh, print, can't find, oh, because this here is commented out. Okay. So this is now the print macro coming from the log crate. And this, uh, now it's unhappy again. Cast requires that must outlet static. Let's call the lifetime of this reference. Yeah. Um, how does this work? Is it like this here? Lifetime cannot start with a number. Init logger. Do I need to do this here? Is that how you do it? Lifetime cannot start with a number. Then we call it a lifetime a defined here. Lifetime a defined here. Uh, lifetime may not live long enough. Cast requires that a must. How about we just make it static? Oh, that doesn't work. Static is a reserved lifetime. Yeah, I wanted to make it static. Do I need to put that here? Um, no. Hmm. Maybe I don't need this here at all. Maybe that's just it. Oh, now it's unhappy again. S does not let, oh. oh. S needs to live longer. There is unfortunately not like you live like forever or something in Rust. So yeah, this requires a bunch of fiddling. Um, yeah, this always gets me lost completely. So let's do the following. I will go to my vision 5.1 branch, uh, which I have here. Sorry, mainboard star 5 vision 5.1, uh, boot zero. And let's look at the code here. Because I sort of started that here, I think. I mean, we have the print line macro and so on here. Um, yeah, we're saying init logger serial. So in init logger, we're, we're passing serial and serial is just you are something new. Oh. And we're not, oh. We're currently not using the log crate here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's look at the history of the file here. Oh yeah. Look, work in progress, work in progress, work in progress. Yeah. This here is where I was switching. To the logger library. Hmm. I didn't need to have any of these lifetime annotations. Interesting. So we did some log experiment here. Oh, yeah, some weird stuff that hadn't worked. Uh, so something not working yet. Yeah. Okay. I think this here is still Oh well. Wait, it, w it was compiling at some point. I'm very sure. So when we want to compile this here, do we just say make mainboard and it works? 
Okay. Um, if we go back a bit to this here, this here, get check out this. Can we make it? Oh, look, that works. So let's see what we have in source main. So we have serial, right? We have this here. Init logger. Um, wait. Right. We're doing this, and we can also do that. Oh, S is just this. Now that works. And now we just pass S like this. It doesn't have to be mutable anymore. And we have compiling, compellingly compiling code, I think. Yeah, let's see if it works. Um, it doesn't seem so. Okay, so yeah, let's um, let's have a look at the log init again. So th there are some problems here uh, with using mutexes. So what I'm first going to do now is I'm going to comment out the mutex stuff, and instead I will just say logger equals some serial, right? And now this here changes to that and this here changes to that and that could already compile again let's see and let's see if it actually runs it may oh uh yeah this is when the transfer didn't work but it compiled at least Stupid, tra stupid transfer thing. Yep, um, that is running again, but yeah, we don't see any, we don't see any output. Well, at least the code is compiling. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not too sure yet uh, what the issue really is. Um, what we can try is, uh, we, we can try doing this here in our own code. So in, instead of like, instead of passing the logger here, instead of saying log init, and instead of using the print macro, um, we can we can just assume now that that serial is now already just our serial, and uh, hang on. This is the wrong file. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to get back to the logger. 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 Hang on a second. This is source lib log. There. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to do the same as down here. So this is essentially the code that we also had. And in theory, uh, we, we should be able to use the logger now. 
So in, instead of using the print macro, I could say, where is it? Here. So instead of the print macro, I should I should be able to say if uh, oh, we we need to do the same thing here. If let sum l equals and mute serial, then we can say l dot right uh cannot find serial why it's a it's a static static mute that should be hoisted static mute should be like available in like everywhere cannot find value in the scope huh weird Um, maybe this is like a visibility issue. Oh, nice. Now it works better. Um, expected you ate, not and stir. So yeah, this, this write function now, this is not formatted writing. Um, do we, oh, do we actually get write fmt? No. Um, yeah, we would need to import core fmt right. And then we, we may be able to do this. Uh, yeah, because this is not, so yeah, this is only implemented up here. So here is where, uh, we also say use fmt right. And here is where we actually implement, we implement fmt right for zero logger and zero logger is this thing here. Uh, this is the type that we're using for uh, the zero that we're passing here. It's, it's a bit complicated, but yeah, whatever. Um, then let's just, let's just do a write. Let's just see if uh, it actually works by saying we write a number and we write the beautiful number 42. And we don't care about the result. Okay, let's see if that works. Well, it does. So yeah, hex 42 is the letter B. So that is good. We are now using our mutable, static mutable serial thing, right? And now what we want was, uh, we actually want to have the print macro. That was our initial goal. So the question is, why doesn't this here work? Because technically we're doing the same thing here. Um, Yeah, let's see again. So when we say init logger and we say log init serial as mute dot unwrap this year, this could technically go wrong. Um, uh, what we can do is in, in, our, in our init function here, where is it? Or is the init up here, right? So we could now already just say uh, serial dot right. We could we could also write something here, right? So we could say I don't know forty four. Let's say uh, dot okay. We can see if that works, and I'm almost certain it should. Uh, yeah, except for this issue. Let's do it again. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Well, we don't see anything. And why don't we see anything? So this is now the init function this year, where I'm passing the same serial that I was using here as well. And I'm passing it as a mute reference and I'm doing unwrap. This is where things, you know, can go wrong. Um, we actually had this working before. So on, on a different uh, processor core, we had this running and we had this running using atomic instructions and, you know, actually using the mutex stuff and everything, which I, you know, just uh, swapped out for the time being. So yeah, the question is why that doesn't work. Um, let's do the following. Let's, let's also comment out the print here. And let's see if we can still do this here. Nope, we don't see anything. So in, instead of saying unwrap, we could also do this here again. And we can we can do an or else here. Or else. And now we need to pass a Lambda, I think. Uh oh, but it needs to have an argument, that one. And I think Oh. Yeah, we're we're missing some parentheses. There we go. Okay. Closure is expected to take zero arguments. Okay, then we give it zero arguments. Expected mutable reference and... Huh. Oh. Okay, we need to do this a bit different. Um... We will not. We will call something m here, and we will say m equals yada yada. So we're saying m equals m dot. Okay, let's let's put the unwrap here again, like this. Okay. So we're saying unwrap. After the unwrap, we're doing this here. And if unwrap fails. Technically, we should we should get into the panic handler here. So I will I will write something here and I will write an uppercase A. Oh, this operation is unsafe and yeah, whatever. Unsafe. Everything is unsafe here. We're doing firmware. Okay, so let's see if we get an A. Uh, we get the stupid C. Oh, we get a B and we get a D. Hang on. Why does this work now? This is the D. 
So the D is the hex 44 character. We didn't didn't see that earlier. Huh. How about we try a print now? Do you want to print? Do you want to cooperate? I take that as a no. So yeah, um, you may also hear some annoying sounds because the board is actually not even, like it's it's not balanced because there are the connectors at the bottom and they really make it hard to handle it sometimes. Huh. Okay, now we don't get any output anymore. So was it, was it really the print macro? Was it the print macro that was causing the issue? So this here worked, the init worked, right? So we, we can actually keep this line here. So this is printing a D. This here worked fine, right? Mm -hmm. And then the print macro was causing trouble. Let's see what we get now. Ha, huh. we're, ge we're getting the D and we're getting the B. Okay, so this here is printing the B and this here is printing the D. So I want to actually use the print macro and the print macro is doing this here. So this here is apparently failing. So because that doesn't work yet, let's actually do the following. So let's do this here. Um, let's see if if we can use this code which is using the uh, logger thing here. Let's see if we can do that in the init. So we're saying logger equals some serial. And then we're saying if let some L equals and mute logger we're saying l dot write fund arcs unwrap. Now we can say else serial dot write I don't know forty seven or something. Um, it's a bit unhappy about this. Hang on. Oh. Yeah, because that is not a global import. Can we just make this global? No. We need to have this in our specific scope. Okay, then we put this here. Oh, we had it here. And now here, instead of saying arcs, we say, I don't know, hello. Um, except, oh, yeah, this one's the format macro something. And format is from like, ugh. Uh, format uh, alloc filmed format alloc ready that sounds fishy oops 
alloc y alloc anyway uh, args turns into hello uh, format goes here Yeah, this is this is not the Okay. So we want to say use core format arcs. Is it format arcs? No. Is it in core right for fm and then format is it is it here? Or is it, oh, it is actually core fim format. Or do we need to say use macro here? Like this. Uh oh. Can't find. How did this work? I thought it was like that. Macro use, not use macro. Of course. Only has an effect on extern created modules. Then how about extern create core film? How about now? Um how about now? Can we just say fim Why are we using fim anyway? So we're using fim right. Hmm. Uh, internet, help me. Rest format macro. Format instead. Stood, filmed, format. Then it should be just core, filmed, format, like this. It failed to resolve. Um, yeah. So usually core and std are like almost like very, very close actually. So there's a lot of stuff that is in uh, core, which is otherwise also in std. I just really forgot where it was. Or should we not actually have it somewhere in here? Like, oh, oh look, there it actually is. Why don't we just copy it from here and do this? Boom. Problem solved. And we run it again. Uh oh, it expected uh, macro export. Hang on. Where is. Okay, I accidentally inserted some, some crap somewhere. Uh, here. Oh, yeah, something put stood there. Uh oh. Yeah, I cannot, cannot borrow. <sighs> Rust, you're not making this very easy. We can just ignore that part. We, we can see if this works at all. Ah, uh, transfer error again. Uh, 
Aha. We see no output. We see no output. So I have a suspicion that this is actually this is actually the problem here. So what this is saying, like if, if logger is set to something, then we would want to do this here, right? And initially logger is set to none. And then we should hit this branch here. So what I would expect is I would like to see a D. So 44 is D, then a G. But we don't see a D and a G. Huh. Something, something is problematic here. So this year worked. Only this year doesn't. Interesting. Oh, well, it's, it's probably something stupid. Anyway, um, yeah, we've actually been running here for like, has it been two hours already? I don't know. Anyway, um, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I will stop this here for now. And yeah, next time I will see if I can find a solution to this year. And until then, take care and goodbye.